Okay, we're going to uh, start a series of applications chapters. Uh, the first one has to do, obviously, with bonds. So we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about interest rates in general, and then uh, the second part we'll talk about uh, corporate bonds and, and their valuation. So I'm sure everybody understands the definition of interest rate. It's obviously the cost of borrowing. Um, but one of the things we have to also kind of get in the frame of mind is, is that the cost of financing is a return to someone else. So if you borrow money from the bank, you pay the bank 5%, it costs you 5%. But the bank receives that 5%. So the 5% is that bank's required return for your financial soundness and your um, wanting to borrow some uh, some money. So interest rate required return are quite frankly usually talked about the same thing except a different point of view. One from the investor and one from the, the borrower. What kinds of things impact inflation uh, uh, interest rates? Inflation obviously impacts interest in the long run. A very short run inflation has very little impact. In fact, even over maybe a year period. Uh, historically, inflation is in the ballpark of around 3% on average over the last 80 some odd years, but currently it's very, very low, maybe as low as maybe 1%. Certainly, risk has an influence. The riskiness of the person who desires the income. So obviously the riskier a person is, the more an investor wants to be compensated to give them uh, some funding. And later of course is uh, liquidity preference. Uh, liquidity obviously it refers to, in this case, uh, the ability to turn things into cash. So short-term securities are preferable to long-term securities. So we'll talk about how these factors influence interest as we uh, as we go along. The real rate of interest is an interest rate that's kind of a base rate. It is that interest rate that's created by the supply and demand of money. Um, this is uh, essentially something that's primarily controlled by the Federal Reserve. But this real rate of interest changes with economic conditions, sometimes with tastes and preferences of investors. But quite frankly, it also is from time to time altered by the Federal Reserve. So the supply and demand mechanism, uh, everybody should understand how supply and demand works. Obviously, if the Federal Reserve decreases the amount of uh, uh, money available to us, right, then we would obviously see then if they, uh, in this case they're actually increasing, they're increasing supply, they increase from supply here to here, there's more for us to get, so that means that interest rates will go down. Very frankly, the thing that changes the supply of money more frequently than that um, is really just the Federal Reserve. It's not a market-based uh, uh, supply for the, for, the, for the most part. What changes more frequently, though, is the demand curve. The demand for governments, businesses, and people to, uh, for uh, funding that, uh, that they need for whatever purposes uh, they may uh, Excuse me, maybe may be looking for. The nominal rate of interest, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is the actual interest rate that's charged, right? So it's that annual interest rate we've been talking about, right? So this R star, the real rate, uh, is, is a component part of the nominal rate. So what are the characteristics that go into this nominal rate of interest for an investor? Certainly it's the real rate, but we have to worry a little bit now about inflation. And we also have to take into account the riskiness of the uh, security itself, but also of, of the issuer. 
So here we have a basic formula that the R sub 1 is the risk-free rate of return plus the risk premium. The risk-free rate of return includes the real rate, this R star, and the inflation premium. Again, the risk premium, remember, changes based on the riskiness of the person and the riskiness of the security that they're talking about. So we can have another formula, basically, is a little bit more of a, uh, a synopsis, if you will. The rate of return for any investment is the risk-free rate of return plus some risk premium. So if we have an asset that has no risk premium, the risk premium is zero, then the return on that asset would be the risk-free rate of return. The risk-free rate of return is comprised of the real rate plus inflation. So if inflation increases, what happens to the returns of all investments? As inflation increases, the risk-free rate increases, which means the required return or interest rates in general are going to increase. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, just kind of highlight the risk-free rate, these two components, the real rate plus inflation. Um, where can we find this number? We'll actually look this up in class. But it's typically, we refer to the risk-free rate as the rate of return that you get on a treasury security. Because a treasury security has no negligible, uh, um, has, has very little in the way of risk premiums. So the inflation premiums driven by individuals. The real rate driven by supply and demand. So the component parts, they do change from time to time. Now, let's talk about this just for an instance with respect to a specific kind of a treasury security. The United States Treasury offers what's referred to as an I-bond. It's an inflation-adjusted savings bond. So essentially what they do is they alter the payouts based on inflation. So uh, to say another way, they have issued a security that is issued by the United States government. So by definition, it's risk-free. But they now also add this other benefit in that it is also inflation risk-free. So the only impact, the only return that you would receive on this is the real rate of return. So we have some questions then. If you had two treasury bonds side by side, one was an I bond and one was a regular bond, which one would have the higher return to its investors? It's the one that has the least, or excuse me, the highest return goes the one with the most risk. And the most risk is the government bond because it has both the real rate and it has the inflation risk. So how would that also then impact price? So if the government bond had a greater return because it's riskier, the way you get a greater return is by paying lower prices. So regular treasury bonds will have lower prices than I bonds. I bonds will have lower returns than United States government bonds, um, similar bonds obviously. So how can we understand or get a picture of what's going on with interest rates in the economy? The term structure of interest rates is a table, if you will, that shows the maturity of a, a set of bonds compared to the rate of return for those bonds on a, on a certain day. So it, again, it is a table that reflects maturity and returns for similar types of investments. What's a little easier to see though and to understand is something called the yield curve. The yield curve is just a graphic uh, depiction of the term structure. One other term to kind of toss in here before we move any further is the idea of yield. What does yield to maturity mean? 
if you buy a bond and you get all the cash flows that you're supposed to get and you hold it to maturity, this is the rate of return that you earn on the money that you invested. So here we have a series of yield curves. At the very bottom we have a picture that depicts treasury bonds. And these, these graphs are um, um, generated by me. They're not realistic graphs. But the point I'm trying to make here is treasury bonds are going to have a yield curve that has some ups and downs. In this case it has an upward slope. But there are other bonds, right? There are bonds with differing levels of risk. Those bonds will have higher returns. Now, will those bonds, will the yield curves, will the returns on those bonds exactly mimic treasury bonds? And that is for an investment class to interpret and to kind of understand. They will be very similar, but from time to time they may change based on supply and demand, etc. So again, if we assume that these curves are fairly consistent with each other, if you can forecast interest rates, then you can forecast these other um, types of securities. What's the relationship between stocks and bonds? When, when bonds are increasing in value, typically stocks are decreasing in value. They move opposite of each other. Right? How can you exploit that relationship? How can you utilize that? Well, we haven't discussed that yet. That's actually a question for the risk chapter where we want to talk about the um, how risk, how you measure risk, and how creating portfolios impacts the risk of investments. So we'll continue on with that when we get to a later chapter. So here is a picture of actually three kinds of yield curves, upward sloping, downward sloping, and one that's fairly flat. Uh, right now we have a curve that's fairly flat, but it is upward sloping. That is, 30-year treasury bonds produce a higher rate of return than uh, individual bonds or, or bonds that are going to mature within the next 30, 60 days. So long term pays a higher return than short term. So how are these curves created? Can we, can we explain them in any way? Well, we can. This normal curve it is typically upward sloping. It's an indication that interest rates in the future are going to be a little bit higher. The inverted curve doesn't happen all that often. It, increased, it, it indicates that generally interest rates are going to decline in the future. And of course, a flat curve just indicates that maybe interest rates aren't going to change very much over time. So how can we create this curve? How, what are the theories that, that, that create the curve and create interest rates in the economy? The first one is something called the expectations theory. The expe expectations theory says that investors essentially create interest rates. Our expectations about what we think is going to happen in the future causes us to, to make purchases today. And those purchases have a forward-reaching impact on interest rates. So again, if we, uh, if we think that interest rates are going to rise, that's going to result in an upward-sloping yield curve. And we're going to talk about this in class, but the law of one price is a very important concept in finance and it kind of fits here. It says, look, for any two investments that are exactly identical, they have to produce the same rate of return. So if I'm willing to pay 6% for a two-year government bond and I'm willing to pay 4% for a one-year government bond, then what would I be willing to pay for the second one-year bond of a two-year window. Well, this investment here, let me just highlight this, this investment has to be exactly identical to that one. It's the same business, if you will, in quotes, but it's segmented into two parts. So if the first one has a 6% rate of return, the second strategy has to have a 6% return as well. 
So the very first year it's 4% and the second year is going to be roughly 2%. They have to have the exact equal returns. So if I know what I'm paying today, it helps me to identify what do I think is going to happen in one year increments moving forward. And again, we're going to go through this example there and we'll talk about that. We'll actually go through an example and talk about it in class. The liquidity preference theory says that people would rather lend money short term than long term. So if people would rather lend short term, how can I get them to lend long term? Well, you get them to lend long term by offering them more return, more profit on their investment. So in general, the longer the term of the security, the greater the risk should be from the liquidity preference theory. So the upward sloping curve is an indication so far of two things. Number one, it's an indication of what people expect to happen in the future, but it also is an indication of liquidity, that people prefer to have uh, uh, short-term lending, um, and to get them to lend long-term, you have to pay them a higher rate of return. The third segment, or the third uh, um, theory that explains the shape is called market segmentation. And it adds the supply and demand mechanism into the mix. So now it says, look, there are times when there's a great demand for uh, middle term types of bonds. Bonds that have lifespan between 5 and 10 years. If there's a great demand for those kinds of bonds, then the prices for those bonds, because there's high demand, prices are going to go up. If prices are going to go up, what happens to the returns when people go to buy those bonds? Well, since prices are high, the bond uh, returns are going to be lower. So that could give us a dip in the curve, kind of a smiley face, if you will. So the three things together help us to understand how interest rates are um, established and how we can create uh, predictions and forecasts of what we think is going to happen in the future. We can look at some of the results of this. We can see that uh, here United States Treasury bonds are averaging about 3.18%. But what about corporate bonds? They obviously all have higher returns, and the riskier the bonds, as you go down this uh, rating scale, you get to higher and higher returns because of higher and higher risk. So what's the risk premium? Well, if risk-free is 3.8, anything over the risk-free rate is the risk premium. We can establish and look at these risk premiums, and th these are the three primary ones, default risk, maturity risk, and contractual provisions, conditions that the, uh, the, uh, the borrower has to meet. And all of these characteristics filter into the end return or the end yield that uh, investors will get when they invest in bonds. How we can kind of play games with the, uh, the numbers a little bit is to look at uh, some of the variables. So here we have the real rate and the inflation premium. You take the real rate plus inflation, you get the risk-free rate of return. So in this case, the risk-free rate is 7%. Now for this particular security, it has a risk premium of 8. So the total return, the nominal return, is the risk-free rate plus the risk premium, that's 15%. So you can see these three bonds have different types of uh, nominal returns, all dependent on impact of the risk-free rate and impact of risk premiums. We do have a spreadsheet that we can play these games and just plug the numbers in and out. The only thing that I would like to mention here is that there are two tables, one called the Fisher Effect and one's the Fisher Effect Approximation. If you're talking about any kind of a bond and you use the words risk premium, then you must use this approximation model. It's the only one, you notice the variables, it's the only one that has risk premium in one, as one of the variables. The top table here, 
the Fisher effect is really only used for Treasury securities because Treasury securities, the nominal rate of a Treasury security is what we refer to as a proxy for the risk-free rate. And again, the real rate plus inflation gives you the, uh, the, the risk-free rate. Now the difference between the two is this is a theoretical number. It utilizes some uh, time value uh, concepts, but this is an approximation and it does not use uh, time value concepts. So for similar problems, the answers will be very close, but they will be different uh, in, in their nature. So again, if we're talking about no risk premium, you're almost always going to use the fish Fisher effect. However, if it ever asks you for an approximation, then obviously you use the table here below.